welcome you to our best practice showcase, celebrating technology innovation of Hispanic success in higher education. My name is Karen Rivera, and I will be in charge of introducing the speaker for, for this breakout session. This session is being recorded. The present will let you know whether you will be able to address your question at any time during the presentation or after the presentation is finished. This presentation will be delivered in English. Simultaneous translation is available in channel five. Additional headphones are available in the exhibitor's area at the rotunda. We will appreciate that you change your mobile phone to vibration or silent mode in order to have your full attention to study section. Finally, we will distribute the evaluation form. Please make sure to complete it before the section is over and hanging before you leave this room. Now, we are ready to start. The present of for this session is Dr. Miguel Parker for University of Houston downtown. Her biography information was included in the conference apps and website. Uh, welcome, Dr. Murillo. Thank you very much for having me. Do you, do you want to give me the uh, other microphone? Um, they're not going to be able to hear you. The, the handheld will only hear me. Uh, I'm going to move. Well, for their questions? Um, um, yeah, we, we have. We'll just right over here. Oh, yes. We'll just put it right over here and they can, or I can take it to them. Yeah. Well, thank you everybody for coming and uh, what a great day, right? What a great place to have a conference as well. Um, so interesting, I thought some interesting thoughts uh, from our plenary uh, speaker this morning. Um, uh, I am a professor in biology and at University of Houston downtown, but I'm also the executive director of a program for uh, science, technology, engineering, math, and computer science students. And uh, so while I'm not going to focus on the technology aspects, even though it is heads, I am going to talk about uh, the, how we're trying to address an issue in terms of STEM, not in terms necessarily of the greater university, although it is impacting them, and I'll have some data to, to show you regarding that. Uh, but how can we improve this idea of whether it's broader or narrow, and in this case it's going to be a narrow interpretation of what retention is, what student success uh, metric of completion is. Our university, 14,400, uh, is a minority serving and, and uh, uh, Hispanic serving designated, uh, federally designated institution. So we. We are educating the future workforce of our uh, United States, we like to say. And sadly, we have um, really done an injustice in some ways because we have not been, over the last, I would say, I've been here seven years and prior to my coming, uh, the focus was access, absolutely only access and with no, really very little thought. I don't want to say no, but very little thought and action given to securing the completion for these students. And so what we were, when we were graduating students, when they were graduating with tremendous debt. And so we brought in a new president and uh, the charge really is, here you have an HSI, MSI, we have to be the ones to graduate the minority population because they're coming to our institutions. And so part of, uh, the, the rationale for this grant is uh, when you look at the STEM arena, uh, science, technology, engineering, math, computer science, you see even more dismal numbers. You have, you have high numbers typically entering and dismal graduation rates. And, and there are reasons for that, but what we try, uh, so, uh, so my story today to you is to share with you what it is we've been doing with the, this grant that we, that we have. And please, if you would like to ask questions in, uh, as we proceed, that's fine. I, I believe they want you to use this, so just raise your hand, I'll bring it up to you, or if you want to save your questions at the end, that's fine. Uh, so again, I've said most of this. Uh, we, are, we are traditionally a, a commuter school, meaning we don't have 
residential halls. Uh, but in our in our case, our Scholars Academy has it's 17 years old. So we've been around almost uh, a, almost a third of the 40 years that our institution has been around. And we, because we have a smaller population on the average of 160 to 185, all on full scholarship, those students, uh, we have in the past and currently also create new programs to keep them on campus. And that has a a contributed to some of the success that we're seeing. But generally speaking, we are considered an urban uh, uh, commuter campus. Uh, we have a, a very, I mean, this, this is the best selling point we could have for our students, the, a very low tuition rate. And that means that when we award a scholarship, that money goes a lot further and it means that they can take a full load and then progress at a pace that will get them through. Now our yardstick, nobody's from Texas here? Okay, well, may I ask what? Oh yeah, okay, great. So you know, well of course now are you Del Mar Community College? No, Texas Okay, so you, she, she has a great idea. Of, you know, the yardstick is six years, six years. Now, if they would change the yards for, for commuter colleges, non-traditional populations, I really believe, and our president has put together some data, I don't have that for you today, but if they would look at a 10-year graduation rate as opposed to a six-year graduation rate, they would see a, a real soaring of uh, minorities that are graduating. Uh, in, part, in part, that is because they're, they're part-time students, and so it's gonna take them longer. But nonetheless, so you feel my pain, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you have, a, I, and actually I was born in Corpus Christi, so I. You know, I'm, I'm very familiar with that university. So we do have, a, uh, we're primarily undergraduate. We are in the process of bringing on some graduate uh, master's programs and uh, being led by our business school, but we do have one now, one in our uh, College of Science and Technology, but we're striving to get, to get more. So in uh, the College of Science and Technology, you can see that we have about a thousand, a little over a thousand uh, STEM majors. So that's a little under a university of our size, even though we don't have that uh, that uh, tier tier one kind of uh, mentality. So just to, uh, I'm going to do this because you know, I like a little color. It just look, now if anybody goes to sleep, I'm going to call you out. <laughs> okay. So just to give you a little idea, we are really in the middle of downtown, and ironically, five miles away to the south is the, the uh, Houston, University of Houston main campus. They have the football team that won the Peach Bowl. Anybody heard of them? Okay. And, you know, we have a lot of confusion in the name, but it's really a wonderful uh, sister a system, school and system that we are a part of. So that's our building. This, this building was around one of the first buildings built in, in uh, Houston, downtown by the Allen's Brothers, and then that we've added on since. This is our Commerce Street building, and then we do have the Metro Line. We used to say we were the start and stop. Now it extends to the north, and actually has it grown our enrollment to some degree, and then this is our business school, just to give you a sense. So really, we only have three buildings at this point. We've been uh, fortunate after, gosh, seven years that the legislature, we, we put together the right proposal, and they're going to fund it with our help, uh, they're going to fund a new science uh, and engineering building. So that will help us grow our science. Um, just to give you an idea of how, how we fit in, we're about, uh, the Scholars Academy is about 17 to 20 percent. It varies from semester to semester because they have to maintain certain requirements and GPAs to keep their scholarship. Uh, but we have um, mainly natural science, of those, mainly biology majors. Um, of those, mainly pre-med. They're all pre-professional. Pre uh, here we have, this is our fastest growing uh, main, uh, department right now. The computer, si computer science and engineering technology was merged two years ago and it has just taken off. Two years ago, if I would have shown you a statistic, this would have been 36% because uh, computer science was in this this department, but now look at the switch, just dramatic. And we only have engineering technology, which means it's more an applied. They can get their professional PE license, sure, but uh, 
we believe that if we can bring on an engineering program, one or two, which they're in the works right now, that it will just explode. It, it could surpass the natural sciences and double our enrollment. So, of course, we do have a vision within my small area. Uh, we want to matriculate everybody. And uh, when I came, I began to look at the data that they had. Uh, that was uh, seven years ago, so they had about uh, nine years of data. And nobody had calculated, well, wh where are they going afterwards? And so we have started to track that. And we know that a majority, well, almost a majority, 44% of our freshmen who enter and complete go on to graduate or professional programs. So that's an amazing statistic when you think about HSI and MSI students. And uh, it's an important statistic. Now, it's not the only reason that we're here. But, but we have and do concentrate on the talk with the students look beyond that four-year degree. So we want them in the workforce, but we want, we know too, having gone through a certain recession recently, that a BS in engineering will not keep you from losing your job. Look at NASA, right? They've all been out, they all have jobs now, but they've been outsourced in terms of, uh, uh, what do they call that, when you love? Uh, you know, you have to buy for the uh, the uh, contract. So they're all contractors now. Well, just to give you an idea, so our Scholars Academy, with the exception of uh, the uh, our Asian and other population, we really do resemble our our main larger campus in terms of males and females, and uh, that's a good thing. Now, where we are lacking a little bit, we do we are lacking in the. Uh, African American population, and really do strive to bring them on board. Uh, and part of that is uh, cultural. So we, a lot of our summer programs will focus in on the minorities, and especially African Americans, so that we can bring them into the fold and create a culture. Now, this data is of uh, 2015, but you would see a similar kind of picture today. So uh, this this program was uh, entitled Modeling Intentional STEM Success, uh, and uh, again, you know, we're really the uniqueness about this program and the importance of the program is that we're in the fourth largest city and one of the most diverse cities globally, and so we must we are well priced and well positioned to serve and generate the, that workforce, uh, especially in STEM, uh, for our region and our state. I would say maybe similarly, the A&M and Corpus Christi would be similarly, similarly placed for the Valley, right? Now, what we also do is we serve a lot, almost 76% uh, first generation students. So you're talking about students who, when they go home, they don't have anybody who has gone to college or has any hours or anything. So we, when we set our programs up, we have to nurture them. We have to raise expectations and close any gaps that are there, which we know are going to be there. But we've got to really help them understand what this is about and what they can become. And we do have some uh, techniques that we put into place. So. The project design, uh, we wanted to, so we have this entity, this uh, academic unit called the Scholars Academy that's very successful, but it's not perfect. We don't graduate one for one, 100%. So we have some growth to do also, some, some remediation to do. Uh, and so what we did was we overlaid this uh, intentional program on top of the Scholars Academy, and then we looked at a control group from 2012, both for the university and STEM and for the, so we call them the non-STEM, non-SA STEM, and then our STEM. And we opened up all of the program elements with the exception of one, the two things, the scholarships and the uh, field trips. We opened up every other part of what we do, and we're trying to see the impact of that, of these these elements that we put together. Now, the program was uh, funded uh, by the Department of Ed. It's a minority-serving education improvement grant. 
and for 750,000 for three years. So we are in year three right now. And so the, the data that I'll show you <coughs> will deal with years one and two and partial year three. <coughs> partial. So what, what, how do we put this, what we're calling full exposure together? Well, these are the elements, and then I'll talk a little bit about what they're gonna be doing or what they did do or are doing in just a minute. So we included a faculty and peer mentoring system for STEM majors. Uh, we included uh, broadening experiences that dealt with careers. The, the issue for the, for the minorities that come to us, <clears throat> they've been to the doctor, they all wanna be doctors. But because they've been to the doctor, right? They don't wanna be dentists, they've not been to the dentist. They don't know. They don't want, they don't have conceptually, and it's a noble, be a doctor. I don't want to dissuade anybody from being, going to medical school, but there are so many arenas that they could really perform in, right? And they don't know about that. The computer science students, they want to go to work in industry immediately, which is great, but there's so many other things they could do and with the, the intellectual capacity, let, let us pay your undergraduate degree and let the graduate programs pay you to get your master's or PhD, then go to work. You're going to have to work the rest of your lives. But it changes your impact, you know, a programmer codes, right? That's that bachelor's degree generally, but a master's or PhD, programmatic, directional, types of opportunity. Still, you could program if you wanted to, but that's not the essence of what you do. Uh, <clears throat> so then we also put together a graduate school preparation initiative, and that occurs uh, every semester, open to everybody. Now, why? Because we want to encourage them to take the GRE or take the, the MCAT or whatever pre-professional test they need to take. Uh, while they're still in the undergraduate stages, don't leave without taking that test because then your entry is uh, diminished, right? It's expensive and the minute you walk out, you stop using the math alone, the math, and you know, then you have to take an expensive test to get tutored. And we actually see some of our alumni coming back to get this. Now, again, remember, we encourage this. <clears throat> we don't force anybody to go. PhD mentored research. This, I think, is the one component <clears throat> that is having tremendous effect in terms of helping them envision more than an undergraduate degree, envision that they could go to graduate school. And <clears throat> I'll, I'll show you what follows this. And then finally, <clears throat> as a result of the research experience, like any scientist, any academic individual, we want them to go tell their story. And so we support them with the travel money as long as they get accepted. We don't send them just to go, right? They have to be presenting a poster, a paper, an oral, or something. And it's amazing. Now this, when they go and present, it's transformative. They meet people like them they see places they would otherwise not see. And it, it really, beyond a motivator, it really changes uh, their lives and their, their vision, their internal vision for what they can do. <clears throat> so we call these elements the freshman ramp up, the academic skill monitoring. That almost sounds like high school, right? You just have to do it. The mentoring. Uh, career and research skill development and then leadership development. So how do we accomplish all of these? And that's what I'll continue to do. And pardon me, you know, I'm, it's too much for the screen, but I can tell what I'm going to talk about. So here, <clears throat> these were some of, these were the, uh, the GRPAs that the uh, federal government really wants everybody to, uh, so that they're similar, the, the projects are similar in nature. So we said that we were going to measure the grades, C or betters, for the freshman and sophomore year in the gateway or high attrition STEM courses. So for us, that would be the 
<coughs> excuse me, and maybe at your university, that would be the Bio 1, Bio 2, Chem 1, Chem 2. And at our university, if you are a <coughs> biology major, remember we have more biology majors than anything else, you have to take Bio 1 uh, at the same time you take Chem 1 as a freshman. That's asking a great deal. Even if they're smart kids, that's asking a lot. And, and the reason you have to take it, you'll be behind in your sequence. So then, if you don't take that, you're already beyond the, the, the six-year mark. You can't complete because they're really tightly locked in degree plans. Then the other thing, we were going to increase male, I mean females, and we were going to look at their grades. You know, right here we wanted to really increase the number of students that enrolled in the Full time. And full time is important because full time enables you to come close to the six year degree. If you really calculate it, they have to be full time. They have to go a summer or two or they will not make six years if that's your metric. Now, in Puerto Rico and other uh, places, they may not, that may not be your metric, six years. You may have no limit on how long they can go. You just are counting, do they complete? So that I don't know. We really wanted, and in, because it's STEM, and this particular uh, MSEIP really wanted to increase females, right, because females are lacking in the STEM arena. And finally, uh, we wanted to see how many uh, achieved the degrees, and then how many females achieved the degrees. And then we were gonna do a programmatic, uh, review of what what worked best and uh, uh, apply a matched research design to that. So our evaluator did that. And we do have some information as to the first two years. So the ramp up. So what was the ramp up composed of, right? Well, how do we get them? Well, we have to bring them in before the, the semester starts. We bring them in uh, one to two weeks before the academic fall semester begins. We bring them in in July before the August semester begins, right? So they're accepted, they're gonna do orientation with a larger university, but we made a point to bring them in in July, have contact with them, and here's where we have that first contact. We bring them in, and you're gonna say, well, how much effect does one day have? Well, we do a survey, and it has tremendous effect. And the reason it has effect is because our, our, all of our College of Science and Technology professors will open up their research labs. <clears throat> they'll stay in there, they'll select, the students will select, pre-select, a half-day program here, a half-day program here, and then those professors will be with them that full day. They'll have their undergraduates with them, right, doing the work, but the professors, the PhDs are there talking to these kids and telling them about the cutting edge research, even at this undergraduate institution that we are doing, and they get hooked. They get excited. They don't even know yet that we're going to give them a stipend after their first semester, freshman year, continuous through the end of their sophomore year to do research in a lab or labs. They don't know that part yet, so we've already grabbed them. And I'll tell you, it is hard at any university, but at all the tier ones, it's tough to get all of your STEM students' research experience. Uh, what they turn to now is in class. So I'm doing a lab, and we're gonna look at C-phages or something. HHMI has that, right? And that, that instructors can be trained on and bring to their classroom. So it's within that lab setting. But that's, that's a lab setting. You still don't get that really individualized uh, depth of what is that PhD's research agenda. And, and this sort of starts them out there. Now the other thing we do is we have course reviews. So we bring in the co-PIs of this grant who happen to be, uh, one is in biology, one is in chemistry, uh, one is in mathematics. Uh, let me think, I'm missing one. Oh, one is in uh, environmental and geology, right? Environmental and geology. And so they will come in and give a day talk over a course of a week. 
they really don't have the whole day. We'll give them about a half a day. And they'll pick out, the because they've taught these subjects, they'll, they'll hone in on, here are the concepts we already know are going to be stumbling blocks in that course. Now, that's not to undermine the professors in the courses. It's reality. Uh, you know, cellular respiration and photosynthesis in bio at a molecular level, that's in a chemical level, that is hard to understand. And it may take you a lot of studying and a lot of time. This is a preemptive a approach. So we do that in the summer. And then we follow up with uh, an orientation, a one-week orientation that's uh, using the peer-led team learning model. So we have undergraduate upperclassmen that lead these small groups and they, they actually uh, become a cohort, I would say, at this point. They get to know each other. They do lab experiments across all of them. Next summer, our goal is to bring in the engineer, pre-engineering and uh, use robotics across all of those sciences as opposed to just doing biology and, and chemistry and experiments so that they're talking to each other. And so when they start their academic school year, they know people. And then we follow that, uh, well, we bring their parents in. And I'm just going to say, and you, you know, I'm singing to the choir here, uh, for the minority students, you have to reassure the parent. If you don't have some component of parent in what you're doing as a university, you're going to lose a lot of these students. So the parents uh, sit with our faculty mentors, they sit with our peer mentors, we give them a dinner, they ask it, we tell them about the program, uh, we share with them how we're going to help their students, some of the opportunities they're going to have. They hear from the undergraduates that are peer mentors and how, how beneficial this particular program was when they were uh, freshmen. And so then they Q&A. And, and actually, they will leave uh, feeling confident that this is the right place for their student. Now, I'm going to tell you, we're nobodies. I mean, I hate to say it. We are nobodies first choice university. They come to us because they can't afford other places. They want to go other places. And so we say to them, we're going to help you get there. Let them pay you to get your master's or PhD. Right? But come here. And, and they figure out it's a great deal. Or we get the people who went to those other universities, those tier <coughs> ones. It was too big. It was too expensive. I couldn't pay for any more than a year. And they're back. And they come to us. So we're, we're really, I mean, unlike the, the flagships that are in our state, we're serving a, a population that really needs to be served. Right? And the flagships are trying to serve them also. But, you know, they're bringing in 7000 a year, 5000 a year. And some will fall by the wayside if we look at just the statistics. So, so anyway, in this colloquium, they'll get to see research posters that the students have done over the summer and be able to talk to them. And I'm going to tell you one quick story. Uh, this was three years ago when we first got the grant, and a young man, had, he had come to everything. And he'd been accepted at Texas A&M. I won't say which one. Uh, and I was wondering, so that's what his mother told me as we were talking at this parent colloquium. And I was wondering, why is he here? And I would talk to him, and he'd say, I'm trying to decide. And it was this night that you know, his parent really wanted to go to a &M, and he decided he wanted to come to us because of the research component. He could get in quickly, right? And he had, he's in his third year now. He's done research every semester. He's gone off to SACNAS and others and presented. Uh, and so that was like a turning point. It's such a huge, so this research, being able to do research early is a huge component. Okay, and then uh, during, so I'm still on that ramp up. During the fall semester, the school has started now, 
Uh, we do a full day orientation and they are, they are put in discipline based groups, peer groups. And they have a peer mentor that's been trained, an upper division student, and they have a faculty mentor. So we have right now 17 of the peer groups. The peer uh, mentors get a, a very small stipend, and, but they're the main contact for peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. And then the faculty mentors, they contact them about five to six times per semester as well. But it's discipline-based, so they get to talk like-minded, right? I want to talk about engineering. I want to talk about computer science, even though we're there as a whole group. And so it's a way to see, and you know, it's a way to see how many kids are very interested in being serious students. We assume everybody in college is that way. The one of the last things that we do, we have a freshman seminar. Of course, now it's a really part of the core for the state, but we we've been doing this for a while. We have a different name for it. And so all of our entering freshmen in this particular program uh, are enrolled as a cohort. Okay. Now, the greater university is trying to do that, but it's still self-select. And so two years after we've initiated it, they're actually looking to modify that and take the, their courses, based on what we've been telling them has happened, to a discipline-based right, as opposed to an interest-based course. And it makes good sense if you're trying to, here you have people who haven't necessarily declared yet, how do you funnel them in to their particular uh, discipline area, academic discipline area, will expose them through that discipline. So we'll see. And then the last of the uh, ramp-up pieces, we do uh, midterm and pre-final interventions. So the co-PIs of the project, that the that discipline experts, will offer uh, review sessions across these areas. Okay. Now the math person, you know, she will do uh, <clears throat> college algebra, she'll do pre-cal, she'll do trig sections, she'll do cal one, cal two. And it, you know, where, when we know we have freshmen, we'll look at this before, but when we know we have freshmen in Cal 3, then we will, she'll offer that as well. So she's really working hard with this, but they're all working pretty hard. So that is the ramp up piece, what we're doing as an overlay onto this smaller unit. But remember, these, these are open to anyone Okay, now the skill monitoring, so what do we do? Well, we offer, and through the grant, we're able to pay for free tutoring. And we offer tutoring at the lower division, meaning the Bio 1, Bio 2, and then we offer the, the 400 level courses, 300 level courses that, that have a sufficient need. We'll offer that kind of tutoring. So very specific to the courses. and. Uh, we do that for bio, chem, physics, geology. We do that for engineering. We do that for computer science and, and the math as well. So it's a whole spectrum. Now the university does offer um, the lower division math. That's really all that they offer. They don't offer any other tutoring services whatsoever. So this has a, you can see where everyone is coming not just our students. So there's an overlay. We do check midterm grade reports. And uh, well, I do that, and then we send uh, the, the form they have to complete has the faculty mentor on it. So this is a chance for the faculty mentor to talk to their small discipline-based group and help them make a plan. Now, in particular, when I bring them in, I sit and make a tutoring plan with them. You know, I will, the first question I ask is, well, are you going to tutoring? And they'll say, oh, I went once. And I go, well, do you think, you know, now we're, we're nine weeks into this, right? Is one time getting it for you? 
and absolutely not. And then they'll say, well, we don't have time. I don't have time. And I'll say, okay, write your schedule. And of course they have time. They just haven't acknowledged. And they haven't given it enough importance. And we do save a good many here. Now, our, we have, our students that are in this program have to maintain a 3.0 or they lose their scholarship money. And for them, that's drastic. Now, we go a long way also. If they have less than a 3.0, then we put them on probation for one semester and then we come up with other plans so that we know that they are going to do better. Um, this young man, I'll just say this, the young man that decided he would go to UH downtown versus the A&M University, as a sophomore, which is not unusual, as a sophomore, he dipped well below 2.6. I mean, that's a huge dip. Uh, and so, you know, I had a talk with him. I put him on probation too, which means that's it. You got to raise it or else. And you know, I had to talk. And it also affects the amount of money they get. They don't get full scholarship. They we deduct a little bit. Um, so they have investment in the recoup, recouping their good standing. And he, oh, I wrote him a note. This actually at the end of the fall semester, he raised that to 3.1 in one semester. I mean, it was an amazing story. And there's a lot of them like that. Uh, we also, to monitor, we do the course reviews. And we send out notices to students who need to go but may not be aware or acknowledge that they need to go. And we do that because of this, right? So get over there. And we do kind of track who attends, who doesn't. Uh, in terms of the larger university, of course, these are open to anybody. Uh, academic school catch up uh, or acceleration. So we instituted with this grant, we were able to institute. Now, they don't give, they don't give scholarships, right? They give stipends. And so uh, from a, another fund, we were able to uh, institute an application process for tuition for one summer course. So if you needed a course to graduate, we're going to fund it immediately, right then. And if you needed a course to get back in good standing to stay with us, we're going to fund it. Right? Keep them with you or help them you know, get closer to finishing. And so if we had more money, if I were to invest in one thing, well, I would do the peer group and the faculty group mentors, the discipline-based mentoring system. But I would do this. You cannot keep them academically eligible if you can't help them, right? And then the tutoring. The tutoring's huge. And then finally, again, we put them in this uh, freshman course and we do track them, you know, we have them as a cohort, but we instituted service learning and to, as a reminder that, you know, they are on full scholarship. You need to give back to your community. This is a way to remember how much you're gaining from being associated with this, right? And then it's good PR. It's just a good thing to do. And uh, this has been instituted for uh, since uh, three years ago. This is our third year. And somebody said to me, oh, you can't do that in freshmen. They're not mature enough, and nor do they. They just need the time to study. This has brought focus and purpose to why they want to pursue their degree. And as far as enough time, in this course, they plan it. And if we have to give them time out of the course to complete the service, we do that. Sometimes it is outside the day, but most of the time it's inside the day. All right, our mentoring very quickly because I'm trying to get to the, the detail, the, uh, the results. So again, discipline-based groups, I've already talked about that. Uh, here are the networking meetings that they have. So the peer, undergraduate will work with the faculty mentor they decide together and uh, they incorporate the students that are in their group what do you want to do 
So the first meeting is they work on a curriculum vita or a work <laughs> resume. That's in the fall. Now why is that important? Well, we're already giving them research experiences on campus. We want them to go and be eligible for research experiences off campus with the REU programs, with the SERP programs that are funded by all of these agencies through many universities. And, and so we know that a CV, a resume, needs to be in place. And then the, the spring semester, we have them develop a personal statement. And the peer mentors and faculty mentors work with them on this. Okay, then the, the uh, midterm grade report is another place. They have to have a one-to-one -one interview with their faculty mentor. Now, that does more than just say, okay, you need to step it up, or you're doing a great job, tell me what you're doing so I can share with others. It gets them acclimated to speaking to professors, which is going to be their in for research, right? I have to be able to speak to professors. Then finally, uh, they do a service project also within the peer group, and they try to link it to their discipline. Now, I'll give you very quickly one example. Uh, the computer science group, this happened uh, five years ago, where you know, everybody wanted to do the environmental cleanup because it's easy and it was there. And, it, and it's wonderful. If you're an environmental discipline, that's great. For the CS people, we really challenged everybody and said, try to find a project, a service project for your peer group that contributes, supports your discipline that you want to move into. So that CS group found, uh, with HISD Houston Independent School District, they found several schools that were, uh, they had collected old equipment, old computer equipment, and they were breaking it all down and building new computers. Well, how perfect for that computer science group, even though they're into programming, they're not so much hardware, but they know the hardware, and then they're building computers that the kids get to take with them. And mentoring younger people who are also helping build those computers. So that was a great one that we had, and it, it still persists today. And then finally, the uh, another uh, networking issue is that the faculty mentor will put together a field trip, dis discipline-based, and those kids will go on that field trip. So it might be industry, it might be graduate program research labs, whatever it is. And we, we you know, we, if we can do a day trip, we'll do a day trip. For example, we have a grant with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and we actually take them to uh, Rosebud, uh, it's the uh, Comanche Peak Nuclear Power Plant, right? To see, you know, and we, we have biologists go, as well as engineering people go because they need environmental remediation specialists. Uh, then finally, of course, we've already talked about this, so they prepare these statements. So that's the mentoring that we do. So throughout here, hopefully you can hear what I've not stated, that they're in contact with PhD scientists and undergrads that are successful, and they are be, they're modeling for them how to, how to be. Okay, in terms of careers and research development, of course, we do this to try to broaden what they know. And many, many students will change, not change their major, but change their emphasis in terms of what they want to be, as I say, when they grow up. Uh, here, we will put the, we, we begin primarily with the co-PIs, because they're being paid from this lab, and we will put them in the labs, assign them based on interest, all of the uh, people in this intentional program. That does not stop the PIs from bringing on non-SA members, right? Because what they learn is that freshmen are capable of doing research if you train them. You don't have to wait till they're juniors or seniors, which is when most people, right? Now, if I were at a tier one, I think this would be difficult to put together because there's so much money and uh, vested interest on the part of the PIs with big grants that fund those kinds of projects.
is right here. These, this is a little more basic research that we're doing. Uh, uh, and then uh, now, the, the reason I put this here, we know if you have read Mercado's research, and if you haven't, I would really encourage you. Now, he talks about summer reading <coughs> programs and how vital they are to minority students. How much time did you give me a, oh dear. Okay, uh, so I would just say, this is why we incorporated the early uh, uh, research component. And then finally, of course, I've already talked about why disseminate. And then in terms of leadership, uh, we put together this organization, an ambassador uh, club. We train the students, and they actually go out and they, they talk about our programs. So they're getting training in terms of how to conduct themselves in the larger uh, community. Okay, so here's our design. We, the people in the Scholars Academy got this, the no exposure, they got only what they could get if they, got, if they decided they wanted exposure to that. Meaning if they wanted to go to the seminars, they could go to the seminars if they wanted to talk to a professor about getting into research. So uh, just real quick to give you an idea of what our professors, our co-PIs, so here are the kind of research areas that they involve themselves with. And so the kids doing research under them are really doing a, a, a really learning a lot, whether they're interested in watershed or mitigation or not. Okay, so some, are, some of our results. Now you're gonna see little numbers. Uh, and so the plan is as we enter, we finish the third year is to really aggregate. So by the end of the third year, uh, we will have 120 that were in this uh, intentional program. Uh, at this time, this is about 60 of them. Now the blue bars represent that benchmark. Um, we use that 2012 cohort that, that were just Scholars Academy STEM majors, right? And uh, so this just gives you a breakdown of, of how many people are in there. Uh, and so the plan is, I think, to put the whole whole number, the total number together. Uh, so we looked at retention and a uh, just very quickly, this is for the intentional model. So as you can see, for the people that were in the Scholars Academy before this program, uh, we were keeping them at about this rate. So even, even we didn't have a whole lot of students staying. So that was our control. If you notice, we definitely are keeping, look at the impact on the males that we're keeping from 2013 and 14, and we only have the fall information listed here, right? The females, look at this. We already have surpassed and almost, now we had a little dip here, but look at this right here, right? We're keeping more. We're retaining more year to year as a result of this program. And if you notice, Look at this for the third, the, the third year, the beginning of the third year, right? Look at that, that's amazing. All right, and then, um, so when you look at the cohorts, how many are being, so 53, 54% of the 2012 are, are uh, control, uh, and then 75% of the first year, right? And, and look at this, 68% for males and females. So it's a pretty good start to keeping more. Now, what's the average in our state? We're still a little below the average in our state, slightly below. We're almost uh, one and a half times the average of our university as a whole, when, when you consider all undergraduates, not just STEM undergraduates, in terms of keeping them. And then this one is, well, what, what do the differences look like? So we were losing at this rate. We're losing at this rate for the second cohort. So we, we're decreasing the amount of students we're losing, right? And most of that is because we're talking to them, we're bringing them in, we're putting them on probation, keeping them in the program instead of sending them off. Okay, so for the whole, the larger population, meaning all of the UHD STEM students, uh, 
we have this many males, this many females, African Americans. So as you can see, just we're very Hispanic serving. And this is just a breakdown of, of the different ethnicities. And then finally, what, what has the impact been, considering that we're not overlaying across the whole of the stem, but I'm gonna tell you as an end result what is happening as a result of what we're doing. Uh, so 92% were retained, right? And then uh, in 14, we have 76 retained. This was of the control. This is what was retained. So we're a little below what the control was. I Meaning before any program, what was happening in STEM outside of our academic unit. And then finally, you can see that in 15, it's starting. So what I take from this is to suggest, and only suggest, that that larger pro that larger program is being impacted in in a way that really uh, is improving what is happening to those students as well, and those are the non-scholarship students. And then this is just a difference in the cohorts from year one to year two, but it's very incomplete data. We, we're working on that right now. Uh, just an example, so you know, you can see that this we're losing less, and and actually they're losing just slightly more, slightly more. But it's very incomplete, so it's hard to say anything comes from that. Okay, in terms of our targets for the federal government, we thought we'd be at 50% of uh, students achieving C's or better. The Full exposure program was 81% and the larger was 51% actually right there. So we, we beat what we said we were going to beat. And then for the percentage of female students, we're way above in the full exposure program and they're equally at the same rate. But still above, well below what we thought we'd be, but, but still above what the general population is achieving in the barrier courses. So they're not being left behind as, as at a greater greater rate than we, we thought they would. And then this is for uh, the STEM full-timers, 82% are full-time and 86%. Now we thought it'd be higher because they're giving more scholarships to students, uh, but we, we've not seen that. And then finally, in terms of persistence, we're almost at 70%, which would be the state average. And uh, the exposure program is 50%. Now, I want to say something. Our university's uh, retention rate is well below this. So in STEM, the, that program overlay is having an impact on the, the STEM population. Uh, I'm going to skip that one, that's so busy. And just a quick uh, review of what the external evaluator suggested, that in terms of persistence, uh, this is the general. So we're out, outweighing them slightly, and definitely over here in terms of grades. Okay. So this is somewhat incomplete as well, but it suggests that it's having an impact. And then, um, we, we do think, I think I'll just fork out this and just, just say, the, what's happening now as a result of this program, this idea of the peer mentor group, discipline-based groups, is uh, led by a faculty mentor and an undergraduate, is being disseminated to the, throughout the college through the club system. So, meaning that the students are going to be put into the clubs for their majors that already exist. And their, their uh, leadership, president, vice president, secretary, will be trained and act as peer mentors. And the faculty mentors will be trained to act, you know, they're PhD scientists, but they still need some ideas of 
how can I mentor, what can I do? And, and some of the things they want to strive at, making sure they do, is meeting with them once or twice a semester. Doing, one of those meetings would be a service project, bringing in service. And then the last meeting would be the CV and the personal statement. And they believe, now they have, they're, they're putting that into play next fall, and we're going to see how that works, see how well that impacts their students. So at the very least, getting this money, uh, while it looks like it impacted a smaller academic unit, it, it has had reverberations or uh, ripple, right, ripple effect. Uh, but they're doing it on a shoestring as opposed to being able to do it for $750,000. Okay, well, I don't, what I have one minute left, no, five minutes left. I want to thank you very much. And, you know, I hope to come back in two years when we have crunched the, all of the data and give an update on this particular program, as well as an update on what's happening with the, uh, with the extension of this idea to the rest of the College of Science and Technology. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, first of all, it's a great program. Uh, I know that you said it's a three-year program. Is there any plans for institutionalization? Yeah, well, here's the thing. So the Scholars Academy, it, uh, most, most of it is institutionalized. What is not are the, the stipends for the peer mentors, the stipends for the faculty mentors, and the scholarships. So you we say that's coming from a separate grant. It's coming from a lot of places, okay. right? And they're FAFSA. So they, we have great, not only minorities, but great need. And so when we give a $1,500 scholarship, they may only be able to take 600 of it because their, their FAFSA is so uh, high. It covers the rest, so then we give that to somebody else. Uh, but yes, absolutely. And I'll tell you, when I, when I came in 2009, they had just institutionalized this position, the director's position. I, I've since moved forward. Uh, I'm still there, but I mean moved up. We have a program manager that's institutionalized, and we have a uh, uh, administrative assistant. So the core that runs this thing is there, and their belief, the university's belief, is that, and they are trying to replicate this program. So what we think will happen is the College of Science and Technology is extending, taking this ripple, putting it over their students, and if they track what's going on, I, I believe the rest of the colleges will implement that. And it's, it's a really almost a zero cost because faculty must serve, right, service. That's their participation in the mentor group. The clubs are there. I mean, right now they just sponsor the clubs, but we want them to do more. So I think absolutely we will institutional. And you know, that's what we said, that we had letters from the provost and the president when we wrote this particular proposal that we intended to institutionalize it, so. One follow-up question. Uh, I'm, I'm from New York, Lehman College in the Bronx, heavily Latino. And we struggle with getting students in in the summer. So how do you get students to come during the summer? Well, um, here's the thing. You, they know, well, we give them scholarships. They've been admitted <clears throat> to our university, and they've been admitted, accepted, I'll say it that way, accepted into our program. And we say to them, this is what you have to do. You're going to get the scholarship. You need to do these things and you have to come. Now, the other thing, we feed them. We feed them a lot. I mean, you have to get, and it's word of mouth. If they don't come, the follow-up is on our shoulders. We have to get to them before and say, now, do we get everybody in the summer? I'll just tell you, no, we don't. We try. But the ones that come, my goodness, and the parents that come, oh. That, that, that's the transformation for that family because they have an idea of what's going to happen to their student, right? And, and I'll tell you, you know, the rules in college are very, I was a, I was a high school principal, magnet school principal for uh, the last 10 years of my <clears throat> tenure before I went to higher ed. So I've not, you know, I'm a newbie to higher ed. 
but we always brought the parents in, even though, you know, they're high maintenance and whatever, but now, that's what I was not accustomed to at university. It's like university, you know, you can't ask unless they have the waiver. I can talk to any parent that I want. I just can't give them certain pieces of information. But I can talk to them and reassure them and answer their questions. And so, in that regard, because we're a smaller unit, we do that. And I appreciate your parents' involvement because uh, most of our students, and I know because I survived the system. Mm -hmm. I say survived because I made it, right? Yeah. Made it. Uh, most of the students, the first generation, the parents yes. come from other countries. They don't even speak the language. They're not, they're not even. They're not even sure how the system works in general. So informing the parent, it's almost like having a consultant at home. It is right. Because for the Hispanic community, and I'm sure that all of the younger people here can acknowledge. The parents or the family is the main base for these folks. So that's important to put the parents and get them involved. You know, and I always tell my personal story. I remember when I was, you know, 16 and I was applying for colleges and um, they offered me they offered me a scholarship, but it was like a minute scholarship, Princeton University. My mom didn't know what that meant. So she was like, You're not going far away, you have to stay home and I ended up going to a local school. And and not to discredit her, but you have to understand the cultural bias of the people that you serve. Oh yes, oh, oh, we people. find that too. And I'll tell you, the broadening experiences, the field trips, they are expensive. <clears throat> you must do them. Yep. Because if you don't, if you don't get them out away from that urban setting, they're never going to, they don't feel comfortable. Why would they feel comfortable? They've never been there. They never leave. <laughs> or they never end. I mean, this is my second trip to Puerto Rico. I'm much more comfortable. Yeah. Right. <laughs> But I know where I'm going to go now. But anyway, I want to say one other thing. At our website, because we, we have a presence on the website, we stopped putting scholars at uhd.edu. We put my name. Even though that burdens me with email. But you know, people want Correct. names. Yes. They do not want a generic. Yes. Yes, That's meaningless. And uh, well, I hope I shared a little bit of insight and certainly I encourage you to go for the MSCIP and I'll be out here talking. Can I take may I take one more question? One yes. more. Yes. How do you get your faculty involved? Oh. I even though I'm a native English speaker, I lived and worked in Puerto Rico 35 years mm -hmm. at currently at Catholic University in Ponce. We have faculty members who are carrying sometimes an 18 to 21 credit load. Well, they have to carry a 15 hour credit load. So that's all how do you get your faculty? Well, ours only carried a, carried a 12, so that helps oh, a little bit. But oh, I will say this this Scholars Academy began in uh, 1999 by it, it was an uprising from two professors, one CS and one Chem. And they got, there was no money, but they put this system together, part of it, and we really tap into the assistant professor because the assistant professor is running to tenure okay. and they want to get connected. Now, our dilemma now is we don't have any assistants. What do we do? Well, thank goodness we have associates and fulls. We have full professors, five, that are faculty mentors. We pay them a piddly. Uh, it used to be 1500 Four years ago, I had to diminish their, their stipend to 1000 per semester, but it's oh. still a little bit. 1000 per oh. semester? That looks like gold I, from I the know. perspective of Puerto Rico. Well, <laughs> and, and that comes from the grant. Now, if you notice, I, let me just real Even quick, let, let me uh, real quick go back here just to show you. That this is, I mean, we write, I must write three to four grants per month to try to fund, and, and I do all the other things. But if you see here, I mean, we have a lot of grants that are funding us. And we couldn't do this. And, and I'll tell you, it was an argument of arguments to get any institutionalization, because if you go back to the same well, they're not going to fund you. And they, they want to see you institutionalized. So, all right, you all have a wonderful, wonderful uh, conference, and thank you so much.